We have a clock in the office counting down uh, so seven years from July 30th, 2015. We're getting close, right? there. Yeah, so uh, we're about uh, five and a half years in, and uh, we're pretty close to having all the underground pieces done. Uh, the interesting thing about this project, there's a lot more than just the uh, heavy civil application, you know, the geologic engineering application. Uh, obviously, we touch a lot with the lake behind us, a lot of the community. Uh, even impact some economic resources, you know, with the lake drawn down. So mm -hmm. it, it ended up being bigger than just the technical part. So The award-winning Tennessee Wildcast is on the air with the latest on hunting, fishing, boating, wildlife watching, and all things outdoors. Make welcome your host, drummer and outdoor expert novice, Jason Harmon. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Tennessee Wildcast. We thank you for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you're listening to the show, you need to make sure you tune in and watch the video because we are on location at Boone Dam, uh, just below or above Boone Dam, um, at one of the beach access areas and ramps that TVA has put in here. And we got uh, Mr. Sam Benson with us. He's the TVA principal project manager for the Boone Dam Repair, and we're going to be talking about that today. Mr. Matt Cameron is helping me co-host. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Welcome back to God's country. Yeah, it's fun to get back to East Tennessee and get on location and do some shoots out here, and we appreciate you helping us line this up. Picked a, a beautiful day and a beautiful location. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, we're going to talk about what's going on behind us here and, and talk about fishing and hunting around around the lake, but... Um, just want to welcome Sam. Th Sam, thanks for being with us and hosting us here. Well, thanks for having me. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk about what we're doing here. Yeah. I know there's a lot of questions and a lot of people are wondering what's happening and what the future looks like, so it's going to be a good conversation, I think. And uh, we'll look to you for all that knowledge because you are the man with the plan. You know what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, first of all, let's just tell us about yourself, Sam. A uh, your, little bit of your background and what you do. Sure. So originally I grew up in uh, South Central Kentucky. Uh, grew up hunting. A little bit of fishing. Not very good at it. So Same mostly here. stuck with the hunting. I can uh -huh. relate. <laughs> and uh, I guess uh, dated a high school sweetheart. We ended up getting married. Moved to Tennessee, uh, gosh, back in 1997. Okay. Been here ever since. A uh, little bit of work professionally as a geologist. That's a degree. We're in geology from Western Kentucky and Vanderbilt uh, for graduate work. I uh, got two daughters. One's 18, one's 15. The 18-year-old uh, loves to hunt, so uh, she's getting into that pretty steady. And then uh, spent most of the career working on heavy civil jobs, big dirt rock jobs, uh, a lot of dam repairs, uh, a lot of large landfills, large construction type activities. So ended up here at Boone Dam working on the dam. Well, how long have you been with TVA? Uh, so I started with TVA uh, as a consultant about 15 years ago. Uh, so I did some consulting work with them and then came on full-time about nine years ago. And then how did you get to be the lucky guy over this project here? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, well, back in 2014, uh, there was a sinkhole at the toe of the dam. Uh, so they noticed that and uh, started watching it. A little bit of increased uh, vigilance, you know, investigations, and uh, we had a, some muddy discharge. So, you know, I always say this, it makes the engineers cringe, but all dams leak. Doesn't matter if they're concrete or earth, you know, water does move through them. Mm -hmm. uh, but we get real nervous when it starts carrying soil particles with it. You know, it means it's maybe starting to lose some of its mass. And uh, so at that time, they, they drew the reservoir down back in 2014, starting an investigation. And at that time, I wasn't over the project. I was doing some, uh, some other heavy civil projects that were of need. And uh, lo and behold, a year later, they said, hey, we got to repair this thing. It's going to be a pretty big project. And uh, so I got volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> voluntold. Or, or vo voluntold. voluntold. Yes, I got voluntold to come up here. Uh, how how long has this been project been going on? Update people on what's what's happening here. Yeah, so uh, after that initial discovery in 2014 of the sinkholes, uh, again they started looking at trying to find the root cause uh, of the issue, and so in July of 2015, July 30th, 2015, uh, the CEO at that time came out and made a commitment to the public we'd repair the dam. Uh, as he said, we'll do it one time, we'll do it right. Hmm. And uh, then uh, that was uh, basically given at that time a five to seven year time frame, trying to do it for around four hundred and fifty million. So uh, that's what we were given, and yeah. uh, so we have a we have a clock in the office counting down uh, <laughs> so seven say, years from July thirtieth, twenty fifteen. We're getting close right there. Yeah, so uh, we're about uh, five and a half years in, and. Uh, we're pretty close to having all the underground pieces done. Uh, the interesting thing about this project, there's a lot more than just the uh, 
heavy civil application, you know, the geologic engineering application. Uh, obviously, we touch a lot with the lake behind us. A lot of the community uh, even impacts some economic resources, you know, with the lake drawn down. So mm -hmm. it, it ended up being bigger than just the technical part. So that, that's probably one of the more interesting parts of the project. Yeah. It, it of uh, the water, the fluctuation. Was it going down before the, the when the hole was or the the spot was noticed or whatever? Yeah, the hole. sure. So we had moved into the uh, uh, fluctuation for fall to go down to winter pool. Uh, so here at Boone Lake, typically summer pools about 1382, mm -hmm. winter pools around 1364, 1362, uh, and we actually noticed the uh, deficiencies with the dam around 1371. Uh, so within a three-day period, they actually lowered it and set an interim pool, and it's existed that since uh, 1350 to 1355. So we're about 30 feet below typical high pool or summer pool. Yeah. So where we're standing right now, the water would be what? Uh, the water today is about 1359 um, okay. today. So just recently, uh, we were able to bring the reservoir up uh, about 10 feet. Uh, as we're nearing the end of the underground construction. Okay. Uh, so we gave the public a little bit of an advance notice and then pulled the water up. And uh, there's some reasons for that that we can talk about when we talk about vegetation and, and biology on the lake. We, we have some other things that we're doing needed the water to be brought up a little bit to do those things. Cool. I don't want to digress too much, but you mentioned the public there. What was their initial reaction when you told them what was going to happen here? Uh, well, the... Uh, Really around the, the three days to lower the reservoir, uh, it, w it was pretty uh, controversial, mm. right? Uh, so to be honest with you, you know, we, we had some uh, boats that were in lifts, uh, that were left in lifts. Uh, anytime you change with the public, particularly when you're touching a large sector, um, you know, that impacts people. Sure. Mm -hmm. And people don't like change. So it, it started off uh, pretty difficult. Uh, so as a technical guy, right, I have geology degrees. I'm used to dealing with soil, rock, uh, engineering solutions. Uh, but one of the really uh, growth things here on this project for me was what I call soft skills, dealing with the media, yeah. dealing with the public, you know. And uh, so that's been good. But it, it was pretty negative at first. Uh, since then, we've been very fortunate. We do a lot of community outreach, uh, a lot of updates, a lot of public meetings. And uh, we're starting to see that swing around. So... Uh, that's that's been interesting too. Yeah, just recently y'all had a town hall meeting not too long ago. How did that go? And are the, is the public receptive of those and thankful to have those? Yes, very. And uh, we do that every year. So every fall we give an update on what we've done with the project, what's left to go, where we're at, uh, any impacts that we may be uh, getting ready to implement that would affect the public or any benefit. You know, hey, we've passed this milestone, so we can bring the reservoir up ten feet. Mm -hmm. Uh, Showing so, up some progress there. Yeah, it's been really good. Uh, so we do it every year. Now, this year is obviously different with COVID. Uh, we had to do that virtually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that was another learning pattern. You know, it's uh, it's easy to go, uh, you know, to one of the public schools and meet with four or 500 members of the public and get to talk to them, explain what we're doing. Uh, a little different when you're doing it virtually. So I'd say you had pretty good participation in that, though. I mean, it it's easier for people to get out or not have to get out but just log on and and be a part of those yeah we're not sure exactly the total number because it was by household but a mm -hmm. you know a couple of hundred households joined yeah. in for well, that excellent so. yeah that's great we've seen an uptick in our social things and our virtual meetings and and public you know, classes and things like that so sure. it's it's good um I want to back up on the construction underground. Tell us what that's like. I mean, you think of a dam underwater. How do I get under there to, to fix it? I just put some Gorilla Glue on it or anything? <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> so uh, we actually, uh, we approach this because of the need. You know, when you draw a reservoir down 30 feet, you couldn't do the, the typical uh, design, bid, build. So I'm going to go design everything I'm going to do, then I'm going to build it because it takes too long. Mm -hmm. So we took this one in stages. Uh, the first stage was we actually put grout in the ground. So you drill down at depth through the dam into this area that's got sinkholes, you know, cavities, uh, different things, solution channels, and we injected a grout. So grout's a concrete type material. So think about pouring concrete in your backyard, you know, you're building a deck, uh, except it doesn't have gravel pieces. Uh, instead of the larger pieces of rock, it has sand. So it's much more flowable. So we injected uh, at 800 plus locations along the dam grout to help stabilize everything. Okay. Two types of grout. One's a low mobility, meaning it doesn't move very far. 
uh, and we put that into the soil. And then one's a high mo building, we put that into the bedrock to get into the smaller fractures and, and features. Uh, so an example that was given uh, to paint the picture in your mind for those that are listening, uh, high mobility grout would be like chocolate milk. Uh, low mobility that doesn't move very far would be more like toothpaste. So you can kind of think of the, the consistency difference. Um, we drilled almost 30,000 miles of drill holes, 800 wow. plus holes, grouted on about two and a half foot centers on average. Uh, both upstream and downstream of the dam. And that helped stabilize everything. Uh, then we came in and we built what's called an upstream and a downstream buttress. Um, and so that's a lot of rock that's piled up against the dam to just hold it in place. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of rock. <laughs> and what were you talking tonnage wise uh, all this stuff? I think it was about, uh, I should know this number off the top of my head, but it's probably about uh, 200,000 plus tons of rock. Good. So, wow. A lot of rock. Yeah, just a few dump trucks. Just, just a few. Yeah, just a few. <laughs> uh, so that took us about nine months to build. Mm. So then once we had everything stable, uh, we started the last piece of the project, the underground work, about two years ago. Uh, and that was building what's called a cutoff wall. So essentially, there was nothing wrong with the concrete portion of the dam. It was all in the earthen embankment that ties it to higher parts of land. Okay. And uh, that's probably a good thing, right? That's a good thing. The yeah. structure's good. The structure's good. Yeah. It was just where it tied into the land okay. and, and that earthen embankment that had been built. So we built a concrete wall through the center of it. Uh, it ranges anywhere up to 200 foot deep, uh, up to you know 60, 70 feet into bedrock, because some of the rock has you know the cavities and mm -hmm. things that you see with cars. Uh, so we actually drill 52 inch shafts down through the embankment through the rock we fill those with concrete so you get a resulting cylinder so if you imagine a picket fence if you can see that in your mind we overlap those cylinders and it forms a wall so unlike your typical concrete walls we don't have rebar and things in it because you have this earthen embankment and then these buttresses that provide the lateral stability we just needed a concrete curtain to cut off the water from moving through it Wow. This is unreal, man. Yeah, that's I have no idea. That's so, what this uh, really looked like. You have like yeah. videos and photographs of all that. I'm sure you we do, we but. do, we do, and it, it's a little different, you know. So if you're in uh, vertical construction, you know, I'm going to build a high rise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you can imagine, say, the Gulch down in Nashville. Yeah. Uh, I actually got to work on some of those projects. Pinnacle Tower. You know, you think about those tall buildings. Yeah. You can see the construction progress, but when you're doing things underground, uh, it's all by instruments. It's by data collection. Because you can't see what you're building. Right. Right. The crane's still there, and there's nothing changing. That's What's right. Going on? Putting yeah. everything in the ground. <laughs> um, but the, there were 307 of these 52 inch columns uh, that went along the crest of the dam. I guess I should say the, uh, the embankment portion was about 900 feet long. When we got here, it was about 60 feet wide. That's not a lot of space for heavy equipment. So mm -hmm. we actually cut the dam down 10 feet to make it wider. So if you think about a trapezoid, you cut the top off, it gets wider. Yeah. The buttresses gave us some extra room, so we're about 120 feet wide. But initially the work was going on in uh, the area of a football field stretched nice and long, right? So wow. that, w that was a pretty tough with the constraints on just the size of the footprint. Uh, but we, we've got 307 of these elements, and uh, as of today, I think we're pouring number 280. So we're getting pretty close to being done. And that will be the last major underground portion to repair the dam you think you'll beat that uh was it seven year we plan? uh we we do awesome. yeah we awesome. do so uh the plan is you know we've already brought the reservoir up uh 10 feet um this spring we hope to catch the uh typical guide curve and go ahead and fluctuate up uh now what we do need to do is see what the lake what the instruments that we've installed on the dam what they look like under a full head of water a summer pool uh, so we'll bring it up and get close to summer pool this summer, and then next summer, the seventh year, we turn it over and get out of everybody's hair up here. Wow. Well, let's, before we run out of time, that's, that's a lot of great information. Let's talk about uh, the fishing and the vegetation and, and some of the changes that are happening on the water. Um, you can see behind us trees are growing, and I feel like that's, that's what we're worried about as far as boating and, and, and being safe on the water. These are eventually going to be covered up, and folks need to watch out for this stuff, right? Yep. So, uh, and that's been, uh, I was talking about the soft skills, right? So, uh, you know, geologists, we can go over there and we can figure out how to repair the dam, but it's, it's the things we touch. 
so when we lowered the reservoir, we exposed about 1,400 acres of previously inundated land. Um, and then obviously, trees grew. Mm -hmm. uh, some areas grew much faster than even I expected. Uh, pretty fertile land, right? Nice right. and moist. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, a few years ago, we're looking around. We got trees over 20 feet high. So what are you going to do with wow. them? The difficulty at Boone, unlike a lot of our other reservoirs, it's mostly private land. Uh, here, the landowners own to the center line of the channel, and we just have a flowage easement to flood it. So, so it's you not can't your, just go cutting trees or yeah, you know at, we we have well. the uh, we have the right to enter it and maintain it for operations, uh, but it's a little different scenario. So we provided uh, with some sister agencies, you know, some guidance on what they could do on their own land, uh, but for the most part, uh, most of the land. Uh, just grew vegetation most mm -hmm. people didn't cut it right so two years ago we started a program to go in and, and help mulch uh, some of those properties last year we uh, mulched about 650 acres uh, this year we are about 1275 acres as of today wow so if you do your math real quick you say wait a minute that's uh that's about 2,000 acres you said there was only 1400 <laughs> uh, the stuff we cut last year grew back so fast we had to remulch a lot of it so you're trying to just prevent it from growing further. That's correct. Yeah. And then once we flood it, of course, it'll stop. And and there's a nice balance there uh, because, believe me, not everybody wants their vegetation cut. You know, if you are a uh, diehard yeah. fisherman, yeah. Uh, you want that vegetation there. Sure. And there is a benefit to the, you know, the fry and stuff, uh, so getting the lake back. I will tell you, I don't fish myself, but apparently the fishing here was phenomenal the last four or five years. Took a body of water, made it much smaller, mm. so it's like catching fish in a barrel. Uh, <laughs> but now we're starting to look at what's it going to look like once the reservoir fills back up, and how does that population recover? So we want to leave some vegetation, but then obviously protect boaters. I'm sure our fisheries guys in this area would say, hey, this is going to be great for the fish, right? I mean, having all these trees and brush and stuff there. Yeah. But, you know, it is a safety thing, too, with uh, boaters that are maybe skiing or, or whatever, hitting some trees or something like that. Yeah, and this pr this project has been a study in the uh, dichotomy of stakeholders, right? So the upstream public, they just want their boating back. The downstream public wants to make sure we're repairing the dam, keeping them safe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so same thing with the fishermen and the, the folks that ride jet skis and inner tube, you know. Uh, the jet ski folks, the inner tube folks, they want all the vegetation gone. The the outdoorsmen, you know, hey, can we leave some here? You know, this this isn't a high recreation area. We'd like to fish it. Uh, so I, I did get a chance to work at Lake Cumberland in Kentucky for mm -hmm. the Corps. A similar repair, and you guys are probably aware they have fishing tournaments. You know, that's a hot spot in the east. Uh, they left all their vegetation. And uh, so we're trying to learn from that. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've partnered with TWRA, John Hammonds in particular, with TWRA up yeah, here. he's great. Shannon O'Quinn with TVA, and uh, we're, they're doing a lot of fish studies right now. So we're, we're going to look at, uh, off a of baseline, you know, typically we do a juvenile fish study every three to five years. We're doing them at least twice a year, sometimes three times a year here. And uh, they're actually mapping what the the bottom of the lake looks like before the reservoir comes back up. Is it vegetation? Is it clean? You know, is, has it been mulched? Was it not mulched? How high was it? And then they're doing uh, fish surveys for the next three years beyond the reservoir raise to compare to the historical data. Uh, because when I started this project as a project manager, I'm looking through all kinds of publications and papers. You know, should we cut it? Should uh -huh. we not cut it? So hopefully we're going to put out some of that data to help, you know, future projects. Yeah, awesome. And justify what steps should be. Yeah. What should you do with it? How much should you cut? What should you leave? Does it make a difference in the recovery of the fish? Because mm -hmm. a lot of it's just a, a guess right now because you really don't know exactly what the results are going to be, I guess. Really is, yes. But I did talk to John earlier, and and he said all but three species of fish that reproduce well on their own should do very well in the next two to three years after the lake is reflooded. And the three that he excluded were crappie, striped bass, and hybrid striped bass. And we do have the ability to raise all of those in a hatchery. And right now we're stocking those at half of the normal stocking rate just because you have about half of the volume of, of reservoir water. Hmm. When it is reflooded, they'll go back to their normal stocking rates. So I, don't, I guess the long and short of it was anglers shouldn't be 
too concerned that this is going to be the end of, of fishing, it will take a couple years to recover. But like you said earlier, the, uh, all the vegetation will provide the young fish a place to hide. The fish that they stock next year will be already be a year old. So they'll be able to prey on the fish that are being born the first year after the reservoir is reflooded. So it should be a really boom population in fish uh, two to three years after the lake's reflooded. Yeah, and that was, the, that was the conversations I had with them. They said, you know, if you were in fishing, this is where you need to be in yeah. about three years. But the first year <laughs> afterwards, don't look at it to be awesome all of a sudden. It's yeah. going to take a progression to get back. And I said, you know, we talked about it a little bit, but will it be um, almost like a new reservoir, like back when we were setting records, like D.L. Hayes in 55 when he caught the world record smallmouth exactly. bass? And he said no, because you don't have um, – not, you're not going from a river – to a, a brand new reservoir it's only about half so you're not going to see that big of a, a, a boom in it yeah and then uh you know a couple of the initiatives that uh, we worked with uh you know you guys on twra they've uh, they've been putting out reef balls so not just the vegetation mm, yep. but to help with some of that population obviously we uh in partnership with twra installed two no, new two new or improved low-level boat ramps at Pickens and DeVault Bridge they'll stay and then behind us is the Boone Dam boat ramp which was built new and uh, we'll leave this for future use as well it won't just be temporary yeah this is a great great spot right here uh, nice new design here with this circle pull through it makes it looks like it make it a lot easier to load and unload a boat yeah it would have been a long uh, long trek to back down uh and uh so that was a little bigger a little more expensive but i'll tell you during the summer this thing is packed full mm, i mean you I just bet. can't imagine how many boats use it because it's so convenient to get your boat in the water mm. well let's talk a little bit about uh you know once the water levels are up boating safety uh if there are stumps and trees and things like that are there going to be markers for people to see or know what to look for or does it kind of have an you got to have an idea what's the thoughts so, there so typically we mark uh what i would call hardscapes right sandbars rock outcrops you don't typically mark uh, debris with respect to stumps or trees because every time you get higher water flows that hazard moves okay so you know if you anchor a hazard buoy uh, one thing to be aware of for anyone boating if you see a hazard buoy it does not mean it's directly above the hazard so as the lake comes up and down that is a set so that it can drift and it may drift 5 10 15 feet away from the hazard so when you see a buoy don't just assume the hazards directly below it mm. but we don't typically mark things like trees or stumps because they migrate they move uh, with the water right. and so you would give a false sense of security you know if you tried to mark those but what we are doing as we continue to work on the vegetation we've partnered with some nonprofit groups up here that keep the lake clean uh, one of them BLA Boone Lake Association we've been working with for 30 years they actually do debris cleanup, and we're assisting them with that. Okay. So we're providing some uh, barges. So we drop off the crews to do cutting of vegetation. We take the barges and help them pick up some of those stumps, debris. Uh, just had a big cleanup in the fall where we, we were out in mass helping them with that. Uh, so we continue to work on picking up that debris. And then uh, TVA is committed to be here for about 18 months after that final reservoir turnover, uh, just to make sure that we were there to help pick up some of that stuff. So I, I would say probably as the as the water levels come up slower, that's the time to be really watching, yeah. you know, debris and things like that. But as it gets up to where it, where we hope it is, you know, eventually hope it is, uh, that stuff will be deeper, probably safer for boaters, especially the skiers and or, uh, the jet skiers and that kind of thing. Yeah. So you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, we were fortunate enough to bring the water up ten feet early. You know, just in the last month. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that really had dual purpose. One, it helped us get some data over at the project. Uh, but as we've worked the last two years on vegetation and debris cleanup, uh, you know, stumps, trees, things like that, there were certain coves we couldn't get in. You know, they were high and dry. So we did all the work we could where we could reach. This 10-foot increase has allowed us to access more areas. Okay. Uh, and so it was kind of strategic that, hey, if we can get this now, we can get in more areas, clean up more debris before we go into that reservoir increase this spring which will allow us to schedule as it comes up you know every time we go up another two three feet we can get in another area so it allowed us to schedule that out that's great that's awesome well matt can you talk on the safety side of things you worked on the water a long time what does a boater need out here uh, once they get back on the water what's some of the things that they need to have in their boat to make sure they're safe 
yes. and be legal. Sure. No, safety equipment is uh, something that doesn't change from year to year, by and large. It's been the same since I've hired on, and um, your boat properly registered, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. If it's displaying the numbers on both sides, your registration's current, um, you're probably not even going to get stopped and inspected just for safety equipment. But if you do, if there's a reason for us to stop your boat, um, we're looking for a wearable Coast Guard approved life jacket for every person on the boat. Um, the only folks that have to wear them are uh, children that are 12 and younger. When you turn 13, by law, you don't have to wear it anymore. We advocate that everyone on board wear a life jacket at all Definitely. times because that's that's the only thing that's going to keep you floating um, if the boat goes down or if you fall in or get thrown out of the vessel. Um, you have to have a Type 4 throwable device, which is the square cushion with the handles on it or mm -hmm. the ring buoy like a lifeguard would use. Okay, um, That's designed to be thrown to someone if they fall out of your boat or if they're struggling. Uh, you, you take and pitch it to them like a Frisbee. Uh, you do have to have a fire extinguisher on board if you have uh, installed gas tanks or um, uh, like a, a, a kitchen in the boat or sleeping quarters or anything gotcha. like that. have to have the fire extinguisher. It has to be a Type B um, to, to uh, extinguish gasoline and oil fires. Most of them are ABC, so you really don't have to worry about the type that you buy anymore. And a, a way to make it a, a sufficient sound signal, so like a whistle or a horn. Um, I think law says that if you can yell, then you can that that qualifies <laughs> you. But have a device on your boat. Definitely, coaches whistles. You know, fifty cents or less. Probably get them out of China for who God only knows, a penny a piece <laughs> or something. Cents. Yeah. So have a whistle on your boat because what I tell people is, if you're in the water and you're struggling and you need to yell for help, it's going to be hard for you to, to yell and keep your fa face above water, right? Especially so, this time of year when it's cold. Absolutely. Know? So, yeah, just have a whistle on board. If you have them attached to your life jacket, you're even better off, especially if you've got your life jacket on. Um, and just other things to look for, um, keep keep the life jackets on the kids at all times while you're underway. If you drop an anchor, they can take it off. Um, have a sober operator mm, on board, definitely. designate a sober operator always. And uh, just be careful where you let people ride on your boat because I saw a lot of times on a pontoon boat, like if this was the platform on the front of it, outside the railing, they would want to sit people mm. out there and ride up and down the lake. And I've worked several incidents where the operator had to stop or swerve suddenly. That person got thrown overboard and those pontoons funnel a body right into the lower unit of the engine. And of course that causes a serious bodily injury when that happens. So seat people in seats that are installed uh, by the manufacturer. Definitely. I think this has all been a lot of great information. Um, Sam, I appreciate you uh, hosting us out here and, and, and updating everybody. Sure. Will there be more communications, more town hall meetings and things coming down the pike? Absolutely. And uh, we'll have our spring annual update that we always have. And the next fall, we'll have another town hall meeting, uh, you know, with the public to let them come out and uh, actually talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. Awesome. Well, let us know so we can help yeah. promote that and get the word out. Uh, also, there's hunting right across here. I know we're running out of time, that. but there's opportunities to hunt around some of these TVA properties. So check our website, check your website. Uh, ours is tmwildlife.org. Yours is tva.gov. There you go. So check those places and, and uh, get out there and hunt around TVA, fish around TVA, boat. Uh, just enjoy what's out there and get outdoors. So appreciate you guys. Yeah, appreciate the time. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, this is Tennessee Wildcast, and uh, we thank you all for watching and listening, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Stay connected with TWRA by visiting our website at tnwildlife.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hey, it's all about Tennessee wildlife. It's what we do. Tennessee Wildcast will be on the air again next week. We'll see you then.